Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters, and key figures from the publishing industry, plus loads of hints, tips, and inspiration for all kinds of creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review, or just tell a friend. Right, cue that cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing Grab yourself a drink cause it's joined up right Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination these days can go a long way to sending you crazy, or crackers, as my gran would have said. So try not to do too much of that, and instead throw yourself into all things creative and productive, and that's what we'll be doing in today's show. So I'm Wayne Kelly, and it's episode 122 with Steve Kavanagh, author of the superbly twisty Eddie Flynn series of books like 13, Twisted, and his latest novel, 5050. Steve's funny inspiring and insightful and we talked about his writing process his favorite books and inspirations and why all lawyers have to be good con artists so just before we get to that a quick update from me like many of you i'm working from home following all the advice about social distancing and trying to stay motivated and sane in these scary times that we're living through at the minute I've got to be honest, for the first few days of lockdown in the UK, I was struggling to concentrate on writing anything. I was constantly being sucked into reading the latest pandemic headline and seeking out every possible morsel of corona-related info. Thankfully, bit by bit, I'm managing to wean myself off all that negativity and I'm trying only to have a quick look first thing in the morning then and then maybe drop into our daily briefings which run late afternoon here. I'm making sure I use my daily exercise allocation as well, either with a long walk or a bike ride, and I'm trying to listen to as many LPs as possible, get that vinyl out there. But the way that I really turned the corner was by utilising the power of the deadline. The BBC Writers' Room put out a very last-minute request for short scripts based around the current crisis with themes of isolation and interconnectedness, and they were looking for stories based around Skype or video calls as they want to produce four of these during April, and I'm guessing they'll need to rely on that same technology to put them together in the first place. I came up with an idea at the start of the week and knew it had to be delivered within a few days, which really does help to focus the mind and block out some of the distractions. So maybe you can find a competition or something that's got a submission deadline. I submitted it yesterday. Given the fact that so many of us are uh, currently on lockdown, I suspect they'll get a lot of submissions, so I'm not holding out too much hope of being selected. But even if, I've, even if I'm not, I have decided that I'm going to try to produce the script myself anyway, providing I can find a couple of willing actors. So stay tuned for that. But what about you? What are you doing to stay happy, healthy and productive through all this uncertainty? I want to hear what you're up to, whether it's writing related or not. In fact, I'm thinking of nicking an idea from Script Notes podcast that I heard recently and asking some ex-guests to send me some short audio clips describing their current experiences in lockdown and how they're managing to cope. And that'll be in a future show. So in the meantime, get in touch by tweeting me at JU Podcast or emailing Wayne at WayneKellyWrites.com as I'd love to hear from you. Also... Don't forget to join the email mailing list at joinedupwriting.co.uk to get free stuff and to be the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. Right, let's crack on with today's interview with Steve Kavanagh. So Steve's the best-selling author of the Eddie Flynn novels, as well as some standalone thrillers. In 2018, The Liar won the Crime Writers Association Gold Dagger for Crime Novel of the Year. In 2019, 13 won the Theakston's Old Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year. He's a former lawyer, born and raised in Belfast, Northern Ireland, where he still lives. He also co-hosts the excellent comedy lit podcast, Two Crime Writers and a Microphone, so check that out if you haven't heard it. And depending on where you live, his latest book, 5050, is either out or coming out very soon. So here's the chat that we recorded just a couple of weeks ago. Okay, Steve, thanks a million for joining me on Join Up Writing. Really appreciate it. So why don't we uh, start off? We're not going to mention coronavirus. We're going to manage to sidestep that hopefully tonight. But why don't you tell us where you're speaking from and uh, tell us, uh, coronavirus aside, how everything else is in in the world right now for you? 
Um, well, I'm in uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, that's where I live. That's where I'm from. And everything's going pretty good for me at the moment. Um, just moved house, so I'm 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 from in speaking from my new office, nice, which is lovely, really nice. And um, apart from the world, you know, going <laughs> batshit crazy and people dying and it's all horrible, everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, why don't you um, let's start off just by you telling us about your latest book, which I think is Fifty Fifty. Is that right? Yeah, Fifty Fifty comes out. Um, uh, it's a sort of a staggered release. It's it's uh, come out in Australia. Um, it's done really well. It's hit the bestseller charts in Australia. It comes out in Ireland in April, and it comes out in the UK in July. Um, if if there still is a UK in July or a bookshop to, to, for it to be to be released into, but um, yeah, it's fifty fifty is the story of two sisters. Um, so the sister Alexandra, um, she calls nine one one emergency, and she says, "Oh my God, my father's been murdered. I've just found his body." Uh, I think my sister Sophia killed him. Please get here quick. And there's another 911 call. Uh, Sophia calls 911 and says, oh, my God, I've just got to my father's house. He's been murdered. My sister Alexandra killed him. Please get here quick. Mm -hmm. So both uh, sisters are accusing each other of the murder. Both are put on trial and uh, they're sort of accusing each other. And uh, my character, series character, Eddie Flynn, is representing one sister, and there's a new character called Kate Brooks who's representing the other sister. And the, the, it's a joint trial, so um, uh, the reader will hopefully, you know, be reading this going, well, oh, my God, it's that one. And in the next <laughs> chapter, no, 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 it's this one. And it is a lot of fun to be had. But there is a third sort of point of view in it, um, which is just simply known as she, ah. and it's the it's the real killer, I and see. it's one of the sisters, but you don't know which one it is. Brilliant. So, as usual with your books, it's a brilliant premise, like right from the get go. So, wh where did you? What was the kind of jumping off point for you for that? This one, um, for a lot of my books, I you know I will t I um, I talk to my wife about it. And because Tracy's brilliant with ideas and, you know, she reads a lot. Um, so I'll talk to her and she'll say, give me suggestions and stuff. And um, that's how all the books are born. Sort mm -hmm. of the, the, the sort of the premise is us talking. Sure. And usually Tracy has better ideas than me. <laughs> and she'll say something and I'll just go, oh, that's one. And then I'll just go and write it. <laughs> you just, just, just go and write and it. Tells, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and that's 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 my research. Uh, but I think that's really good to have someone, you know, to sort of spitball ideas with. Because they'll give you good ideas and you'll give them ideas and we'll, you know, they can kind of, as long as you trust each other, um, it works really well. I know a lot of writers who have done that in the past and it works really well for them. It really helps. That's brilliant. So kind of, I, I have seen from Twitter before, you talk a lot about Tracy and obviously the input that she has with your work. So you've kind of got two things rolled into one there. You've got this brilliant uh, ideas person and sounding board, but you've also got your sort of first reader as well. Yeah. She reads the book um, before I send it to anyone else. And she's, you know, Tracy's great. So she, the book's usually in really good, pretty good shape by the time anyone else sees it. You know, she, she finds all my mistakes. Yeah. And she's a really good sense of story and pace and, um, plots and how it's all coming together. So, no, she's brilliant. That's brilliant. So, for people that might only just be coming to your your series of books, tell us a little bit more about Eddie Flynn. What came first, him as a character or the plot for your debut, The Defense? Um, I don't. I can't remember. I can never remember which one did come first. But I didn't remember. I had, a, I had an idea for a character. Um, uh, about a con man. Um. Because I like I like con men. I think the stories about con artists are fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it sort of hit me one day. Well, the all the skills that a con artist had are the same skills that a good trial lawyer should have. Uh, you know, misdirection, distraction, persuasion. Yeah. And <clears throat> the sort of the idea of a character who was a former con artist and is now a trial attorney was was very attractive. Because like that's like you know how the system works really. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I just sort of thought, well, what would be a really bad, I wanted to write a legal thriller and I thought what would be the worst sort of scenario you could have for a lawyer? 
what's the absolute, and, and it's sort of nothing was off the table. It was one of those what if mm-hmm. scenarios. And I thought, well, what if you had a lawyer who was uh, doing a trial and his he had an explosive device trapped to him, strapped to his body, and his client had their finger on the detonator. <laughs> and that was the jumping off point for the first book. And, and then it was because it raised all these questions. Well, who is this lawyer? Why is, is he in this situation? Who's the client? What's going on? What's the trial? Mm-hmm. So I wrote the book to kind of answer those questions. But I was wanting to get to that point in the book where I had this idea. And then I wanted to see, well, why would that situation arise and, and what happened next? So obviously you, what again, what people might not know is obviously your background is in law yourself. So I'm, I'm guessing it works as a metaphor as well, because you probably feel like you've got a bomb strapped to you by your client, <laughs> that your client yeah. can detonate at any moment, anyway, during a trial. Yes, or you can. <laughs> Not only as a lawyer, he yeah. detonates things. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yes, it, it's because it is kind of like that. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, responsibility that comes with being a lawyer. So you get somebody's life in your hands, and they're trusting you. And to be diligent and to be good and to understand how things work and to, to give them their voice. And that's all you really can do. Um, Eddie's sort of character in the first novel, he sort of realizes he's got these gifts and he's really good um, at what he does. But then he learns, well, actually, there's a, there's a price to all of this. You know, am I going to be the lawyer who doesn't care if he gets guilty people off? He mm-hmm. just does it for the money. Or does that have repercussions and what does that cost me? And the rest of the series of of books is really all about Eddie sort of paying for that mistake because he did represent someone who he realized before the the verdict came in was guilty Mm -hmm. and he didn't do anything about it. And someone got hurt as a result of that. And that sort of has haunted him throughout the rest of the series. You don't need to read any of my books in order, but if you do read them in order, you'll pick up on this little thread um, because, you know, in some ways, Eddie's journey, um, how he acts as a character, he is someone who is kind of seeking some kind of redemption, you know, for a mistake that he's made and he's, he's continually paying a price. Absolutely. Well, I I mean, on that point about you don't, you know, you don't have to necessarily go all the way back to the beginning and start at the beginning and and do them in order. I mean, I I think I came, I think the first book that I read of yours was 13. um, And I obviously just jumped straight in. And and as you say, the way that you'd written it, I could get enough sense of the backstory to know what was going on and everything. Is that something that you kind of have to refine in future drafts or is it something you're aware of right from the get-go when you when you're writing the first draft because presumably that that's probably quite tricky to build that in without going over lots and lots of old ground for people that have read from the beginning and stuff yeah it can be a, a bit tricky um the way the way i write i'm sort of quite um i try to write vividly mm-hmm. so that the reader can imagine things happening so I, if there is a bit of Eddie's backstory, I'll try and work that into a scene where something is actually happening. I haven't stopped the story to say, by the way, which you may have missed in previous <laughs> installments, yeah. and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know, so I'll try and drop little bits of information in there because I did want it. Um, I, I, I love reading series. And there's some series where you really do have to read from the start to get mm-hmm. the full effect. But I wanted it that the reader could pick up a book, at, and it doesn't matter which one of my books they pick up. They can still get a whole enjoyable reading experience, and then well, hopefully, as what's happened with you know, most of my readers, they'll read 13 first, and then we'll go back and pick up yeah, the other ones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so uh, I'm, I'm right in thinking that before you started writing books, you, you tried your hand at screenwriting. You were doing a bit of screenwriting. I did, yeah. When I was around 18 or 19, I wrote a couple of screenplays. And I managed to get an agent in London, but I didn't get any of them sold. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, my agent did get Francis Ford Coppola, or what I suspect was a reader for Francis Ford Coppola, sure. um, to read one of my scripts. And the only note that came back was it wasn't Irish enough, <laughs> despite the fact that an Irishman wrote it and it's set in Ireland. <clears throat> I still don't know what that means. Again, but, it's, yeah, one of those stupid notes that you get from time to time. 
She's not Irish enough. <laughs> You're just not Irish enough. So. What? what? <laughs> How what dare you? you? Probably, obviously, his idea of what Irish is, which is not Irish. Well, yeah, or you know, he he wanted a, you know the the quiet man, yeah, yeah, or something like that, or something in a cottage, yeah, where everyone was around on horseback exactly. and, fights and yeah. has fights with people. No, it's not that. Yeah, it's changed. It's moved on a little bit. Yeah. But the reason I was asking about the screenwriting is it kind of occurred to me when you were talking about the way that you try to write vividly and also weave in backstory, but through action within the scene. That kind of sounds a little bit like a screenwriting uh, a kind of tip, if you know what I mean. Because that's kind of a key thing that you do with screenwriting, particularly with, you know, everybody talks a hackney thing now, but show don't tell. Yeah. And you try and weave it in through action. Would you say that's something that you kind of picked up maybe from those early days writing screen screenplays? I think, yeah, I think I probably did. Um, I tend to think of chapters as scenes as well. So my chapters are quite short um, because I have lots of scenes. I also, the only really good bit of advice I ever got about screenwriting was to start the scene uh, late and finish it early. Mm -hmm, Yeah. And uh, that has really helped me and really served me um, in structuring a book. So, yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of cross-pollination um, between the two disciplines. Obviously, there's certain things, you know, screenwriting, you're very constricted by the form. Mm-hmm. Everything has to be written in present tense. Um, and obviously, the formatting uh, is very rigid. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are ways to experiment. You can, you know, if you're writing a Western, you can have it, you know, really, you can make every slug line, you know, sort of, feel sawdusty and gritty yeah. and you know you can really put texture into it yeah but it's much harder to do and you've less space um whereas in a novel you're you're free to go in and out of points of view and different styles different tenses and you know it's it's a much more freer experience but the, the trick that i should have taught myself i think is not to get carried away with that and try to try to focus on the story as much as possible mm-hmm so, so when you started, obviously you, you you go going back to the defense when you first wrote that, and that was you you know it was your debut. Did you know right from the get go you thought this I'm going to make this a series, so I need a character that's going to be able to sustain a series, or did that kind of come later on in the process? No, I wanted to write a series because mm-hmm. I've read you know my, my favorite some of my favorite crime fiction is series stuff. Yeah. So I wanted to see if that was sustainable. And there's not many, many people who were writing a legal thriller series. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about the legal thriller genre, there's two big superstars of it, really. um, And they're both American. It's Mm -hmm. um, John Grisham and Scott Mm -hmm. Giroux. And they all write standalones. Scott Giroux has a kind of a very loose series. You know, they sometimes return to characters, but it's not a series fiction. Mm -hmm. Um. There's John Lesquois, who's a brilliant writer, um, and he has a, sort of a legal thriller series going. But again, you know, he'll dip in and out and do other things. So that it was kind of, it felt like a much more open canvas for me to try that. Um, there's Michael Connolly's Harry Bosch yeah. um, series, and the Lincoln Lawyer now has come into that. Yeah. So that you know, there is a series of Lincoln Lawyer books, but they're weaved into the Harry Bosch world. Mm-hmm. So it felt like I had a I had a broader canvas to try and do that. As no other British or Irish writer was writing American legal thrillers, you know, when I started, or any legal thrillers, there were no you know legal thriller writers. There was the odd book that would pop up. Just um, like a standalone or whatever. Like a standalone. Um, but there seems to be much more people doing it these days, which is good to see. So so bearing in mind, you, as you say, you were starting out with that. That was your aim. Mm-hmm. What what were you thinking about when you started thinking about Eddie as a character and fleshing him out? How much of that fleshing out did you do kind of at the beginning? Or was it a case of you kind of discovered him through that first story? And, and what kind of things do you think you learned? You know, if you're going back again to start again with it, was there anything you'd do differently, or was there, you know, if anyone else is just um, starting out on a series, have you got any kind of advice? You can, uh, if if you sit down to write a series and you think, okay, I know exactly how this character's arc is going to play out over a series of twenty books, mm-hmm. um, you're just a fool. You have no <laughs> idea, and you've got it all wrong. And it's probably not a very interesting character if that's the case. <clears throat> probably not. Yeah. 
if you can, you know, you might have an idea of an arc you could stretch over three books. Uh-huh. But, you know, I think most writers, when you you think, well, I'll try, I'm going to try this. And, you know, I might be lucky enough, you know, in five years' time or 10 years' time or 20 years' time to still be writing the same character. Mm-hmm. But it's, a lot of it's down to the readers. There's a lot of um, – the, the reading has changed recently. Mm-hmm. It used to be um, every, every publisher wanted a series, a brand new series. You know, it's like a franchise in the movies, you know. Yeah. Um, think of all the big best-selling crime writers of the past 20 years, and most of them write series. But in the last 10 years, it seems to have been big standalone psychological thriller novels. Yeah. That have done the best, you know. I think that's fair And they're say, not yeah. series, they're all standalones. And that's really hard to do. And I think almost impossible to sustain Mm -hmm. because you're asking a writer to come up to reinvent the wheel every time, um, every single time. And it's incredibly hard to do. The the writer that I think of who can do it probably best, I think, is Linwood Barkley. Mm -hmm. Certainly in recent years, Linwood Barkley writes incredible standalone high concept thrillers like nobody else, really. And each book is so distinct. You know, there are writers who do high concept standalone fillers. A lot of their books are very. You think I'm thinking? I've read. I read this book. I yeah. read this one five years ago. Yeah, I know you know, what you're saying. Color, yeah, yeah. Uh, different cover and the names have changed. Still enjoyable, but there's not. You know, it's not as fresh. Yeah. Um, whereas Linwood has this thing, just incredible brain. I admire him enormously. Lovely man too. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, for a series. Sorry, <laughs> I, I, I digress. Uh, <laughs> so if we go back to a series. That's what I read, you know, and that's what I want to try and do. And I think if you have, if you, I knew enough not to give him a complete, you know, sort of breakdown on the first, in the first book. I didn't pull every aspect of his personality. You left, a, a, a left it off sort of mystery there. I left a little bit of mystery there. Um, and there's enough there that I can keep going back to. Michael Connolly said it brilliantly. Um, about Harry Bosch. He says, you know, he, he writes a Harry Bosch book and yes, he'll have a story if he wants Bosch to tell, but if, there has to be something, you know, happening to Bosch in the story. Yeah. And he said, someone said, well, what's it like to do that? And he says, it's like putting on an old familiar coat, yeah. but you find new stuff in the pockets. That's a great metaphor, and, yeah. And Connolly, I can't put it any better than Connolly. <laughs> well, it's a great metaphor. So, obviously... Um, you're not from America. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm picking, you know, just in case someone's tuning in halfway through and thinking, this guy doesn't sound like he's American. But you, obviously the books are set in New York. So how much time had you spent in America before you began the series? And, and how did you uh, approach the kind of world building and the other research? I think I know the answer to this, by the way, but go on, tell do us. Do you know the answer? I think I do. I think I saw it somewhere else, okay. and I was like, what? No, I've never been to America <laughs> yeah. before I moved the first three. Right. So 13 is the first novel I wrote having been to America. Which is, having read a number of your books, that's seriously impressive. Uh, I mean, I know, I know it's one of those things, it's like, we all, you know, this side of the pond or whatever, a lot of people think, well, we're kind of really, really are familiar with America through fiction and TV, I suppose, to a certain extent. But still, having read your books, you know, that's in, that's impressive. So kind of how did you, first of all, what made you think that you could pull that off in the first place? And you have, but like, what made you thought you could do it like that? And, oh, um, I was totally delusional. <laughs> <laughs> completely delusional that I could pull it off so did you like have any reservations at all or were you just thought well this is easy I've seen like like because I know that you're a big fan of American crime fiction and stuff so I am um, it was two there was two writers that sort of gave me an excuse um, John Connolly it's his Charlie Parker series uh-huh. John is, a, is from Dublin and writes brilliant American crime fiction um, Southern Gothic American crime fiction too, a lot of it. And Lee Child, you know, yeah. he's one of the most successful crime writers in the world and he's from, Lee's from Birmingham and yeah. he wrote these incredible series of books. And I thought, and the other thing is, you know, in Ireland, I'm sure in, in, in England as well, you're kind of saturated with American culture. Yeah. You know, I grew up watching Hill Street Blues and yeah. Cagney and Lacey and yeah. 
and uh, I loved all that. And so that and reading American crime fiction and American culture, you, uh, the voice came very easily to me. And maybe one of my friends has a theory, it maybe comes to Irish people slightly easier than English people. I don't know why. Um, but well, yeah, but there's, a lot, there's a lot of you guys in New York, for one thing. There's a lot of there Irish is. people, obviously. Yeah. There. <laughs> it's probably there more is. Irish people than than, than any of come as American people. So. <laughs> Well, maybe that maybe a part of our language has has fueled the, that American yeah. uh, language or idiom. Yeah. Um, so it maybe comes a bit easier. Yeah. So I, it just seemed to work for me. Yeah. And so I don't know. Um, I, I, it's what I wanted to try, and I thought, well, if John and Lee Child can do it, maybe I could do it too. So I just it was just having a go because this is really what I wanted to do, and it seemed to have worked. Oh, it definitely has, yeah. So, d- did you? Was it a, an uphill struggle as regards research? I, I mean, obviously, you've got a legal background yourself, but not in American law. So, w- what was what were some of the differences there? Do you have to do, and do you still find that you have to do a lot of research with that? I do um, quite a bit of research, I and mean, it depends on, on. So, here's the thing: you can write something called a legal procedural. Uh-huh which uh, is kind of like a police procedural where everyone wants to know the yeah. name of the department <laughs> and yeah, all the ranks wants to correct know what they do that. next, what's the ranks and who yeah. can do this. And yeah. If I had to fill in a form to get these fingerprint, what form do you fill in to get this thing? <laughs> yeah. And with, with the, the legal profession, it's even more boring. <laughs> and I'm not interested in that. I don't care about that. I don't think readers care about it. No, either. I don't. No. Uh, so it's to me, it's the drama and the action in the courtroom. But to get to that, I need to know the entire processes surrounding it. Uh-huh. But I don't. So and sometimes the reader will need to know some of those, and sometimes the reader won't need to know. And I just take it out. So I do a load of research, and I take most of it out. The plea. Um, there was a bit of research into that because. That's not really a proper trial happening in that. There's a sort of a hearing surrounding all that book. Yeah. So I wanted the reader to know what's going on with that. Um, for thirteen, you know, it's, there's a bit of jury selection in this yeah. book, so I needed to know exactly how that worked, so that the reader would know how it worked. Because in that book, you know, it's a serial killer who mm. gets on to the jury. So what I find is, if it is, if I have a kind of a high concept. Um, you know, slightly uh, outlandish sort of premise. The more real details I can put into that, mm. the more real it becomes. You know, the more grounded in reality. So there was a fair bit of of detail in terms of how jury selected. But again, I'm not really interested in telling the reader. Well, this is how the American legal system works. Yeah. Sometimes I do it a little bit. But it's only so they understand what's happening and what's at stake for the characters. I want the readers turning the pages, and that's what I'm. I really try to do. Hopefully, that I get it right. Well, that was most of the time. Yeah, well, you definitely do. That was going to be kind of my next question was going to be specifically about that. So, with thrillers and, and particularly the, these type of kind of twisty, fast-paced kind of thrillers that you write, see, plotting has to be really, really tight, and it's constantly about raising the stakes. You know, you set them high to begin with, with these high concept premise that you, premises that you come up with, and then, you know, you you just keep ratcheting it up. But you seem to have a it's similar. It reminds me of a little bit of um, Stephen King. I don't mean so much your style, but I mean he seems to be able to do it with supernatural stuff. So he can take something like The Outsider or something, which has got an element of supernatural. And if you wrote it down on paper, just as a synopsis, you'd probably say that that sounds ridiculous, but he's got a way of making it seem plausible um, and sort of believable and taking the reader, you know, I mean, are you sort of aware of how you do that? Is it something that's kind of conscious in your craft or is it just more instinctual with you? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I think it's something that I learned how to do. Um, I'm not sure how much instinct it is or how, maybe how much it was from reading Stephen King. Mm-hmm. You know, because as you say, he's the perfect example of that. If you read Salem's Lot, yeah, there's no vampires until I think, I think you're about 150 pages in until yeah. a vampire rears his head. Yeah, I think you're Well, right. even that word is mentioned. Yeah. But there's 150 pages of building real characters in a real situation, in a real time. Mm-hmm. And then we have, it's kind of like um, somebody said once of C.S. Lewis, 
you know, uh, yeah. Narnia. Yeah. You have to build a wardrobe before you go to Narnia. <laughs> you know, you have, there's a yeah. lot of fantasy fiction and movies where the story starts in the real world, kind of, and then moves into a fantasy world. Um, because if you started in the fantasy world, readers might or viewers might instantly go, nah, I don't buy any of this. Why yeah. is there we green men kind of out here? Yeah. You yeah. know, it, grind it in reality first and then take the reader on that adventure. So that's maybe what I try to do. Yeah, I think that's right. I hadn't thought thought about it uh, in as much as, as that. But yeah, I think you're right. It's the actual characters, isn't it? Making you care about these characters and, and fleshing those out. And then I guess having done that, it's how they react to these on the what are on the face of it sometimes crazy uh you know things that are happening to them yeah i suppose that's the thing that grounds it in reality is how they react to it it's how they react to it and little tiny details make things real Uh um have you ever seen the movie gladiator yeah this is a perfect example of it there's a bit where russell crowe um is betrayed by the new emperor mm-hmm. and he's taken there's three guards take him out and he's riding him out into the wilderness they're going to kill him and he knows they're going to go there and kill his family and um he managed to break free and fight off two of the guards and kill him with the third guard and he grabs his sword to drag it out of the hilt but he can't get it out of the scabbard mm-hmm. the sword's stuck And Russell Crowe says, the frost sometimes makes the blade stick. Mm -hmm. And then he just kills him. Yeah. But that's a brilliant thing. Yeah. Because that you're sort of thinking, well, Jesus, if you were a Roman centurion in Germany in the freezing winter, your sword might freeze to your scabbard. Yeah. But you wouldn't. I mean, that is an incredible level of detail. But that made that whole scene so realistic. You know, little injection of detail like that can really, you know, it, it's worth its weight in gold. So I try to have little detail, and they're kind of interesting too um, for the reader. It's just a little injection of verisimilitude and reality. I think you're right. I think, I mean, Francis Ford Copley it used to say he did a similar thing with like the violence in like Godfather. It's not so much necessarily the realism of it, although there is an element of that, but he always used to try, he didn't just used to be violence for violence sake. There always used to be kind of an interesting little detail with it. So, you know, someone's getting garroted or whatever in the car, his legs come up and he kicks out the windscreen or, or whatever. Yes. It's always, you know, and they're, they're the things that you tend to remember. And again, I know, uh, I think it's in 13, I mean, I won't do any spoilers or anything, but I remember there's a couple of, kind of quite grisly bits in that but again they're kind of there's always some kind of little detail in it that kind of makes makes it quite a vivid picture and that you tend to remember it oh that's that's good thank you very much yeah yeah <laughs> um so so what tell us a little bit about your process so if you were sitting down to write a new book tomorrow i mean maybe you are i don't know uh but how do you approach it do you just off you go do you just start writing you've got this premise you've kicked it around with tracy a bit you've got an got an idea and off you go or do you sit down and you sort of do a chapter plan or an outline how do you approach it well i'll talk it over with tracy and then i'll talk to my agent shane um and if he thinks it's a good idea then I sit down and I start writing it. <laughs> and there's no outlining, there's no plan. I just I just go. Brilliant. That's really I know it's a really <laughs> shit answer. No, it's not. It's interesting. But I'm always interested by that. It's, it's totally how I do it. And it's so it's not really a process at all. I just sort of sit down and I start I I get an idea where where would be a good place to start? Well you know, start with kind of some action, something happening. And I kind of go from there and I just make it all up as I go along. Um, and yeah, so I don't have an outline. <laughs> Sometimes I'll have an idea of some things that could happen, you know, sure, halfway you've through got a book, coming down the line, yeah. Through a book. yeah, that would be so I have something to shoot for, yeah, but I've never started a book knowing what the end would be. You find it as you go along. So say say yeah. something like with your, your most recent book, Fifty Fifty, which I haven't read yet, but obviously you're talking about it. You mentioned it at the, at the beginning. You said like there's this third POV, this she POV <laughs> that you set up. So at what point did you think that that would be a good idea? When did that, that idea come up, for example? Or was it somewhere further into the writing? Or did you have that right from the get-go? No, I, th- I sort of thought, I thought about doing that. But it was, it's... I... um 
whenever I sit down to start to write a book, I'll take two or three days to think about it. Um, because one of the things I try to do in a new book is to try something different. Uh-huh. Um, so for the first sort of two books, uh, The Defense and the Plea, they were very much in the you know, Raymond Chandler classic private detective style. Um, you know, first person point of view. Um, you're with you know Eddie Flynn, and he's the said that that's the only point of view there is in the book, mm-hmm. and that worked really well for the defense because you're in that terrible claustrophobic situation with Eddie the whole way. You're locked in there with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I tried it for the play, and I found it quite limiting. Um, and then for the third book, The Liar, I introduced a little bit of third person point of view mm-hmm. in flashbacks in certain parts of that book. Because I tried again, I wanted to try something different and grow as a writer. Um, for 13, there is two points of view there's Eddie and there's Cain, the killer. And I mm-hmm. really liked that. It made it like a proper chess match yeah. um, between these two characters. Um, and a standalone book where I did loads of different points of view, and it was all in third person. There was no first person in that at all. And for 50 50, I wanted to see could I write an entire point of view? And engage the reader, but the reader doesn't know who it is. Yeah. I thought that's quite technically challenging. Yeah. I, did. I didn't know if I'd be able to pull it off or not. Because would it be readable? Would it be engaging the reader if they don't know who it is? Yeah. Um, and sometimes they might have, a, you know, uh, they might think it's two different people. Yeah. You know, it might start off thinking it's one person and at the end I think it's someone else. And it, it was quite challenging to do because I never wanted to confuse the reader. The reader has to be totally emotional. If the reader is confused, um, just takes you out of the story. Em- yeah. It takes you out of the story and they're not emotionally engaging. Yeah. And they can't be asking themselves too many questions that have to be involved in it. So that was a sort of a challenge for me to do that. So I, I tried to try something. Even though I'm writing a series and I'll, I will do the odd standalone, I'm trying to learn something and do something new with each book, um, and, and in a subtle way. Uh, but I think that's important. Absolutely. So with that, did you did you hit a few roadblocks along the way? Was it kind of did you find yourself a couple of times you'd written yourself into a corner, or you had like a bit of a puzzle to solve with it? Oh, yeah. Well, I see. I deliberately write myself uh, into corners yeah. and deliberately give myself problems. Um, and then I solve them by telling the story. Yeah. Then, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, some, if I write you know, a mystery element in the story, usually at the time that comes up, I won't know the, what the answer is. And I'll have to find it through the car- you know, The characters will have to find it out. Um, so that makes things interesting for me. But it also makes things, you know, the first draft a little bit scary, because what if there is no, I don't find a good answer to it. <laughs> so far, touch wood, it hasn't it's, happened. But. It's, yeah, and you've got Tracy there as well, overseeing things and helping yeah. you get through things, I should imagine. Oh, yes. I mean, she'll, she'll read the, she won't read it until I have a couple of drafts done. Yeah. And then she'll read it. But uh, yeah, if there's something that's not working, she's very quick to spot it. So because you go herring off, as you say, and you've not got a specific outline and you're setting yourself all these problems and you're getting getting through, do you tend to find that your very first draft is, it's a, uh, you know, there's a lot of editing involved or at least you, do you find you go off down a lot of kind of cul-de-sacs and things in that first draft? No. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep going. <laughs> what I do is I stop. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to stop. So when I get to, uh, up to about twenty or 30,000 words, depending how well I'm doing, I stop everything and I go back and I read what I've got. I make notes as I go along as well because sometimes I will there will be something there I think I can use that later on or that's important or I've left a trail dangling here I need to pick that up later on. So I'm kind of orienting myself in the story before I go forward and I'm taking threads of the story forward um, in some of them in different ways. So it's a really stupid way to write a book, really. I think if you were going to do it properly, you would have a nightline. I don't know. I think if it works, no, I I think if it, I don't think there's any such thing. I think if it works, it works. It doesn't really matter. I mean, how you get there. I mean, and I think when, because it's something that comes up on this podcast and it comes up, you mean, you've obviously you've got a podcast, you 
you know, you know what it's like. It's one of those things that often comes up. It's like, do people plan? Do they not plan? Are they pants yeah. and all that kind of thing? But I think, to be honest, I think regardless of which side of the fence you are, I think you, I think everybody does plan and does outline to a certain extent. It's just whether you put it down onto paper. It's like your brain's doing it the whole time. The whole time you're writing that story, and like you say, you stop at some point. You've made notes. And it's ticking away in, your, in the in the back of your brain, trying to solve the puzzles. And uh, yeah. one way or another, whether you do it before you sit down to start writing your first draft, or whether you just write your first draft, you're going to have to think about things, and you're going to have to think about where the story is going to go, aren't you? You do. Thinking time is really important. Yeah. You know, um, when I worked as a lawyer, I would my sort of drive into work and my drive home was my thinking time. You know, I had time there. It just alone and I could just think about what was going to happen next what had come before and what was going to happen next but I still think that is important and at least you should sit down to write having a small idea what will happen next sometimes I don't I sit down and think well I have no idea what's going to happen next which is my <laughs> usual situation <laughs> and I just have to and so I'll spend a wee bit of thinking time at the computer I'll just go and get like, a cup of coffee and then I'll I'll have an idea okay I'll start here yeah. and then I'll come back yeah, no, that's uh, that's good advice. So, how did you get into writing in the first place? Obviously, you you, you did a you ended up doing law as your as your yeah. career. So, but was writing something that was always there? What's your earliest memory of writing creatively? Oh God, I have no idea. To be honest, um, I can probably wrote stories as a kid, but I didn't show them to anyone. Um, uh, my mum, I think, would, would maybe look at stories I'd written, and she liked it. She always encouraged me to write. Um, you know, my father did a certain extent too, but you know, mostly my mum, and she gave me the um, the reading bug. You know, um, mm -hmm. so the, the screenplays is something I tried because I kind of fell into the law, and I I did, desperately did want to try and do this, and I was sort of young and naive enough to think maybe you could do this. Mm -hmm. At one stage, and then you know, it was such a terrible experience. You're trying to write a screenplay mm -hmm. or trying to get one sold, that I thought, "No, nah, it's not for me. It's not working out. Just forget about it." And I then went into the law um, and sort of forgot about writing for about fifteen years. But I still read. I still read a lot, um, and it was always something that I would have loved to do to have done, but I just didn't think it was possible for me to do it. Um, and then when my my mum passed away quite suddenly about 2011, and it, but you know a year after that I thought you know what um, I'm going to have another go at this. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote I wrote the defence as a book that I thought that she would like. That's a great way um, of looking at it, yeah. And that was that was how I had to get started. So you, so you say. I find it interesting that <laughs> you find find the idea of becoming a lawyer easier than writing a book or becoming a novelist. Oh God, that yeah, says a lot about it. <laughs> I think that says a lot about how hard it is to write books. I think it's very hard to write books. I mean, yeah. being a lawyer is easy. I mean, you know, most people <laughs> can be a lawyer. It's not difficult at all. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of stupid lawyers. And a lot of really stupid judges. So, it, it, and it, you do need to be smart to be a lawyer. It helps, but you do need to be smart to be a lawyer. Um, uh, but writing books is is tough. Definitely, it's definitely tough. So, what would you say the whole time you've been doing it? What would you say is the biggest kind of challenge or roadblock you've faced along the way, and uh, and how did you overcome it? And it, it could be a creative thing. It might have been in the book, or it might have just been you know, trying to get your books out of there in the first place? Um, getting an agent. There's two, I thought there was two big roadblocks for me. And I think this has been the most for, for, for people starting off. At the start, you don't know if what you're doing um, is any good or not. Yeah. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. And there's some people who will write, and God bless them, they're having a pup's chance. Yeah. You know, they'll be writing a book that's absolutely terrible and they can't write. And they'll just keep going and going and going and going and going. And you often think to yourself, because you, you might see things like this, because you know, on the internet there's various mm. forums and places where people can post their work. Mm -hmm. You know, and you'll read something and they'll go, oh my God, that's awful. 
Yeah. <laughs> that person can't write at all. And you think, God, is that me too? I'm, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's I'm right. That person. Yeah, that's right. Because yeah. you don't know. Because that person thinks they're brilliant. They, yeah. They have no idea. Yeah. So at the start, you sort of think you're delusional and you think what you're doing has no worth. Um, and you kind of have to be. You have to kind of have to be deluded in a good way to have a bit of self belief to do it, mm -hmm. but you also have to have some kind of critical part of your brain turned on. Um, so I think it's really important if you can have someone to look at your work at the start to see if it's any good. Mm -hmm. Someone that you trust, or there are professional consultancies, but you know he will do it yeah. as long as they're reputable, um, and try and improve it is it is a craft you do get better at it the more that you do it as long as you're approaching it uh, with a critical eye and a critical of your own work and genuinely want to get better and you can see the flaws in your own work um so that's a big hurdle to get over the other big hurdle for me was getting an agent mm -hmm. um because and again, you feel deluded because you get loads of rejections. There's only one writer I know who never got a rejection from an agent and who went through, like he didn't know anyone in the industry and just sent off um, a query letter. Um, and, that, and that's Lee Child. Right. Lee sent one query letter to Darley Anderson. So the only reason he sent it to Darley was because he was the only one agent. That knew. <laughs> in, no, no, he didn't know him at all. He was the only agent in the Writers and Artists Yearbook who mentioned money. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Lee thought, it's so bad for me. And sure enough, he was. But, uh, like, that's incredible. But that's, yeah. but Lee Childs, you want another genius. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're not all Lee Childs. It's total so one-off, yeah. Most of us get huge amounts of rejections. Yeah. Uh, and that's normal. But that, well, well, what I didn't understand at the time was, a rejection by an agent doesn't mean your work's no good. It means it's not right for that agent. Yeah. Or they have someone very like you that've just taken on, or they just don't connect with your work. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's not any good. Yeah. And I guess I guess the difficulty as a, as a new writer or somebody trying to get your work out there for the first time is trying to work out which one it is. You know, sometimes, yeah. as you say, because a rejection is a rejection is a rejection. You know, a no is a no, isn't it? And so I suppose it's and and then you kind of look for things like, well, hang on, they did actually say they like their my they like my writing, but it's not for them. Or you know, uh, this is I like your writing, but this book's not for me. Or whatever it happens to yeah. be, and they explain it. If they give you any kind of extra feedback, you kind of cling on to it, even if it's just a sentence, because often it is just like no, you know, or no reply. Yeah. Or you, you don't hear anything. Yeah, yeah. I, I got a I got a rejection from a literary agent two weeks after my first book was published. Right. And yeah. in the shop, yeah, a rejection. I've heard. Came in I've say, heard. Yeah, I've heard similar stories to that, which is crazy. So it's totally crazy. But the thing is, uh, you do have to look at your own work with a critical eye, but not yeah. too critical. You don't want to, you know, keep telling yourself that you're crap. But you have to know where your flaws are as a writer and what you can improve on mm -hmm. and be willing to improve it. You know, Harlan Coben said a great thing. He says that only bad writers think they're good. Yeah. And he's probably right. Well, I think he is. I think he's spot on. Yeah. I think, you know, I think you're right. Most people I know that can write. You know they're not. I'm not. They've got. They've got obviously got a quiet confidence, but they do genuinely have big bouts of self doubt, and they're not sure about what they're writing or even if they've, I mean, I've spoken to people that have published, you know, many, 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 many novels. And I'll often say, well, it must get easier now in terms of not, not easier to write the book. Cause obviously that's as you said, you're still learning and you want to improve, but that idea of sitting down at a blank page and knowing, well, I've got someone, I've sold the book, you know, I've got an agent and so I know someone's going to take it or it's part of a deal or whatever. And I've not had anybody that say, oh, no, no, I'm still racked with doubt. Like, are they still going to want it when I've written it? Are they, you know, is it, is it, are people going to read it when it goes out? Are they going to like it? What's so, you know, all those kind of things. I think that's kind of a, a say, isn't it? it seems to be like the normal state of a, of a creative. It, it does. And that's why I cringe. You sometimes see writers on Twitter going, I just wrote this thing and it's brilliant and I love it and I'm crying. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, Jesus Christ, I bet you shite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. 
I think you're right. It's not for you to decide that. I mean, we. I think we've all. I think to a certain extent, we've all written things where you you might write a scene and you think, oh, that's my favourite scene that I've written so far in the book or whatever. Yes, yeah, I think, like I think, a I think that's a, no, exactly. <laughs> no, it's the worst thing you can do. You just, I just think that about with life in general. I just think you're setting yourself up for a fall anytime you do oh, that. You, are, yeah. you just just know that you're just going to fall flat on your face. Um, Big time. But. Uh, uh, yeah. So what, what? So I mean, you've kind of given loads of uh, advice within that answer, but has there been anything else or uh, any kind of creative or inspirational advice that someone else has, has given you over the time that you've been doing it? Maybe since you know, I know that as part of what you do now, you you go to lots of conventions and you meet lots of uh, well-known authors and stuff. Have, have you been told anything that you've kind of thought, "Wow, that's that's I'm going to remember that," or "That's something I'm going to use going forward"? Um. Lots of things, actually. But, you know, trying to remember one offhand. <laughs> one, yeah. I will tell you, I'll tell you one. It may not be the best one, because people told me loads of great stuff. But um, Mark Bilyam um, yeah. and I once had a chat. Because Mark's you know, one of those writers who's incredibly well-read as well. You know, he, knows, he knows everything. He's read everything. And he said he once had a chat with two crime writers who were a bit more senior to him. Mm-hmm. This is when he was, you know, just starting off in the game. Yeah. And they said the scenes they really love are the sort of the quiet scenes, you know, the sort of, you know, Harry Bosch and his, uh, you know, and his house on stilts looking yeah. out over yeah. LA with, yeah. a, you know, glass of beer in his hand. Yeah. He, they loved writing those scenes. Yeah. And Mark was like, no, 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 I love, you know, action and chases and blah, 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 and the cops and, you know. Yeah. That's what he lives for. Yeah. And then he said to me, you know, uh, as you know, he sort of, he's gotten much more experience. His favorite scenes to write now are the slower ones. Yeah. The more slower paced scenes, you know, where Thorn is having a pint mm. and just sort of thinking of a thing. Nothing's yeah. really happening, but it's just a little moment. Just creating some and atmosphere. It creates some atmosphere. They're looking out of the window sort of scenes. And I find I really like doing that now too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just, yeah. I love it. And yeah. I have also thought, I love reading. As a reader, I love reading those scenes. I don't skip ahead because that's a character, you know, for example, Bosch looking out the window. That's yeah. a character I've read. Yeah, you know, I've read, you know, every Bosch book yeah. now. And I, I like spending time with Bosch. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's if like a mate the almost, yeah. It's like a mate. You're sure it's a, it's a very quiet moment. It's almost between a moment between the reader and the character. Uh-huh. And that's something which I've... I've I've taken on, you know. But I I've often we are learning all the time, and you, I think you have to learn all the time. I study other writers, I read their stuff, I listen to them talk because I want all this wisdom. I want to know, especially these are the writers who've done it. You yeah. know, I, I mean, I've recently been rereading um, Patricia Highsmith's writing and plotting suspense fiction. Yeah, which is just a joy to read that little book. Yeah, um, it's just there's so much of Highsmith herself in it, and you know her difficulties writing, and she tells you about I tried this thing in, in this book and it didn't work. Uh-huh. Imagine a writer, you know, a I, successful writer yeah. saying, "This book I wrote didn't really work, and here's why." Yeah, I just think that's amazing. So you're learning all the time. The, tr- the trick is to trying to be interested in it and enjoy it and suck it all up. Absolutely, as much as you can. Absolutely. So, if you were if you were starting out again tomorrow, and maybe you were starting, maybe you were going back to that eighteen, nineteen year old, and you were going to have a crack at at books from the get go or whatever, uh, is there anything you'd go back and tell your younger self? Yes, wait until you're thirty <laughs> five. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would have been. I would have been very. I don't. You know. You need I've stuff to read. write about. I I think maybe sometimes you need a little bit of time. Yeah. Um. There's one writer I know. Uh. Well, I, I unfortunately I never met them, but like he started when he was like nineteen or seventeen or eighteen. Yeah. Started writing. I think he's published at like nineteen or twenty. Uh, a guy called Roger Hobbs. Right. A crime writer. And um, he published two novels and he died of an overdose. Jeez. Very sadly and tragically. Right. And you know, Some of the writers I knew and knew him. And uh, he was just an incredible talent. And he had an amazing voice. 
Um, the first book of his, Ghost Man, is, you know, people in this podcast seek that book out. It's brilliant. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I remember reading that first novel and thinking, God, this guy, you know, give yeah. this guy 10 years. Yeah. He'll be the next Elmore Leonard. Yeah. You know, um, of course, he didn't have 10 years. But uh, to be able to have that sort of talent at that young an age, I think is something very, very special. I think most of us, we need a wee bit of experience yeah. and life experience before you start doing it. I'm not saying you can't do it. I think you have to be very special to be able to do it at a young age. Certainly for me, I would have been shit in my 20s at trying to write anything. Yeah. Um, I think I needed a bit of time. I think it's probably dependent on the genre as well. I think if you're going to write the kind of stuff that you write, the crime and the thriller kind of thing, I think, you, like you say, you need to have experienced a bit of life before you can just head go headlong into that. I suppose. It, and it depends what you're writing about. Yeah. You know, you can write about something and you know nothing about. Yeah. And you probably get away with it. Yeah. Um, but if it's going to be anything real that touches readers, I think you need to be a bit older. I'm sorry, that sounds awful, but I do. I think in your 20s, you know nothing. Yeah, Unless I agree. You're, uh, you know, maybe there are really, and there obviously are exceptions, there are really smart people in their 20s. Yeah. Um, who do know stuff and who are brilliant. But if I think for the majority of us mortals, we need a bit of time to wise up Yeah. before we can write anything remotely sort of profound or interesting. And have stuff happen to you. I mean, that's the yeah. other thing. Uh, you know, loss and love and loss and, ever, and all the rest of it. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a pretty good place to sort of round things up. So why don't you just tell us, uh, give us a sense of what's up next. Obviously, 50-50, as you say, is kind of staggered, and so that's coming out in various different places. But and where can people find out more? Um, well, they can go uh, onto my Twitter, basically, is the best place to find me. Um, if people want, I do have a website, but it's very rarely updated. Um, but they can go on to stevecabinetbooks.com um, or stevecabinetauthor.com. I can't remember what it is. It's author, actually. Yeah. It's author. There yeah. you go. Hey. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, you can get my books, you know, wherever books are sold. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, that would be that would be nice. I take it you've got your head in another project as we speak, have you? I guess I have. I have. I'm I can't, guessing you can't lip, talk about it. My yeah. lips are sealed. That's all I can say. My lips are sealed. Well, we look forward to it with bated breath. But for now, thanks a million, Steve. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed, Wayne. It was really nice to come on. Okay, thanks again to Steve Kavanagh, and you should definitely check out his website, blog, and Twitter, and I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That's it for this week, but don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. Make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and that way you can have the podcast downloaded automatically every time it comes out. Also, remember to leave us a nice rating and review on Apple Podcasts, as it really helps others to find the show, or even... You know, just tell someone else about the show with actual words from your mouth or on your social media platform of choice. Next episode is a chat about pitching your book with the brilliant Kate Harrison, where I open myself up to public ridicule by allowing Kate to critique my query letter and synopsis. It's already recorded and I can tell you it was a pretty uncomfortable experience, all in the name of helping me and others out there improve their skills. So look out for that very soon. Until then... Thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Joined up right.